On Friday, Donald Trump spoke at the Black Conservative Federation annual gala ahead of South Carolina's Republican primary. And this was, was, was his pitch to black people. I got indicted a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. It's, it's been pretty amazing. I'm being indicted for you, the American people. I'm being indicted for you, the black population. Oh, and if that weren't enough, he had to add this. The mugshot, we've all seen the mugshot. And you know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. Is he indulging his own brand of racism and stereotypes? Absolutely he is. But he's also echoing right-wing commentators who seem to base everything they know about black people on early 90s rap videos. In August, Dinesh D'Souza tweeted about Trump's mugshot, quote, Think Tupac Shakur, ultimate gangster. Around the same time, the commentator who said last week that Trump's tacky gold shoes would appeal to black people had a similar thought. As one black lady I spoke with earlier today here in New Orleans said, Trump's a gangster. And that means he has cred. That probably never happened. But it doesn't help when black Republicans like Congressman Byron Donalds are doing the stereotyping for them, but worse, creating a false equivalency between the prosecution of Trump's criminality and the ongoing treatment of African Americans within the criminal justice system. Sorry, Byron, it's just not the same. This is political persecution from the Department of Justice and from radical DAs throughout our country. This is something similar that black people had to deal with the, with the justice system themselves. Joining me now is Clay Kane, Sirius XM host and author of The Grift, The Downward Spiral of Black Republicans. Uh, Clay, it's, it's a pleasure having you. I, 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 you know, <laughs> when I'm thinking about this, I just didn't really know where to start uh, in this conversation uh, because there is a lot that is so insulting. Um, but I'll start with this reaction by uh, Biden-Harris co-chair Cedric Richmond, who said Donald Trump claiming that black Americans will support him because of his criminal charges is insulting, it's moronic, and it's just plain racist. Nikki Haley, quote, it's disgusting, but that's what happens when he goes off the teleprompter. Does it work? Does what he's doing work is, is you know, because there are a lot of folks out there talking, oh, the black vote is moving his way. Black men especially are, you know, amping up for Trump. What What's your take and read on why this effort by Trump and the reaction to it by African-Americans? Uh, I don't think it works for black voters. I think black voters are much smarter than this, than what the polls may say and so on. Uh, one thing that's really important to point out is that uh, there is no discrimination there. If anybody in my hometown of West Philadelphia did what Trump did, they'd be behind bars. That's a clear distinction that Trump, the GOP, Byron Donalds, black Republicans uh, don't seem to make. I don't think any of us can relate to, with all due respect, a, a rich white guy from Queens who has more felony counts than I could, I could possibly uh, imagine anybody in my neighborhood having. But the other part of it is that someone like Byron Donalds or the, the black Republicans in the room, the black conservatives in the room who clapped for that, who cheered for that, it is literally a page from my book, The Grift. It is a personification. The reason why they did that, because they know they have to toe the line. And it would make someone like Arthur Fletcher, who I know you knew, the father of affirmative yep. action, Colin Powell, all the way back to Jackie Robinson, roll in their graves. It is disgraceful from Trump and the people who enable him. How do you see uh, the the response to this more broadly? Uh, you talk about the, the African-American Republicans in the room, uh, but then more broadly, what what does that say about our where we are politically and culturally that you have a presidential candidate that can feel yeah, I can get out and say these things with impunity. You had the president back at a rally in an overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly white town of uh, Diamonddale in Michigan in, in the last cycle, presidential cycle when he was quoted saying, you know, to black folks, you're living in poverty. Well, we got the side. Let's just play what the president said uh, to black voters in 2016. 
You're living in poverty. Your schools are no good. You have no jobs. 58% of your youth is unemployed. What the hell do you have to lose? A lot. Because why the hell do you stereotype black people? I mean, we're, you know, you're living in, not all of us live in poverty. In fact, in some states, there are more white people in poverty than black people. But he goes into a largely white community to, to, to spew the stereotypes. What is the, what is the power there that he's trying to, to garner? Does it, does it enrage white folks? Does it enable them? To, what is, what is the dynamic that we should be looking for when he does that? And how do you clap back against it? You know, it's a really important point because it's not just Trump. Uh, Trump is not happening in a vacuum. I call it Southern Strategy 2.0 uh, tactics, using otherism, to be quite frank, to try and gain the white conservative Republican base. And it's beautiful that Nikki Haley called him out, sure. But this is the same person who could not say the Civil War was about slavery. The other presidential candidate, Ron DeSantis, uh, saying there's personal benefits to slavery. Even governors across the country, like Governor Tate Reeves in Mississippi, making April Confederate Heritage Month, uh, this is embedded in the Republican Party. And I think about Will Hurd, a black Republican, who said the GOP must deal with the racism in their party, not only from the politicians, but the base. Why does this resonate with the base? This should turn off the base. Can you imagine if Joe Biden said more people can relate to me? more black folks can relate to me because my son was indicted. That would be an international story. And you would have every black Republican and every, every white conservative saying it was egregious. So why does this resonate with the base? I think it's a long time in the making, Southern strategy, welfare queen narrative, Willie Horton ad, the birther movement. The GOP has to make a decision what kind of base they're gonna appeal to. I'm Michael Steele in for joy tonight. We begin with the reality we've known for months that is now becoming more and more clear by the day. The Republican Party is the party of Donald Trump. Just over 24 hours from now, po polls will be closing in the next primary state of Michigan, where it is likely that once again, the twice impeached, four times indicted former president will be taking home a slate of delegates, bringing him one step closer to the Republican nomination. That's what we saw over the weekend in Nikki Haley's home state of South Carolina, where Trump won by 20 points, receiving just under 60 percent of the vote. Not exactly the overwhelming victory someone who is essentially an incumbent would hope for, but still a clear sign that the party is decisively his for the taking. And it appears that many Republicans, even those who have up until this very moment resisted bending the knee, are accepting this reality. Like, for example, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Despite the fact that the senator hasn't talked to Trump since before January 6, 2021, NBC News is reporting today that top advisors to McConnell and Trump are engaging in behind the scenes, you guessed it, conversations about a potential endorsement of the former president. Then there's Republican National Committee Chair Ronna McDaniel, who earlier today officially announced that she will be stepping down from her post after the former president all but forced her out. To no one's surprise, Trump is endorsing handpicked loyalists, including his daughter-in-law, to take her place, clearing the way for Trump to rebrand the RNC just like he did his buildings as a real estate developer, which we all know how that turned out. Much like his Atlantic City casinos, He's going to run the party straight into the ground, eviscerating all that's left of the once proud GOP, and with it, the legacies of Eisenhower, Reagan, and Bush. Joining me now is Doug Jones, former Democratic senator from Alabama and distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and Tara Setmayer, senior advisor to the Lincoln Project and former Republican communications director. Welcome to you both. So, so Tara, uh, this is uh, a moment. Uh, the party is now fully Trump. It is based, its base is his, its infrastructure is his, its dollars and donors are his. How does this all turn out? 
Well, I would argue, Michael, that the party has been his for quite some time. And you mentioned Mitch McConnell earlier in your setup. And, you know, Mitch McConnell had an opportunity to vanquish Trump, as did many Republicans after January 6th. I mean, the guy led a violent insurrection against the United States. And, you know, for the first time ever in history, a peaceful transition of power was interrupted and incited by Donald Trump. And that wasn't enough. And Mitch McConnell at the time um, gave the speech of his of his career about Donald Trump and, and about what he did, but yet used some uh, constitutional argument to say, well, it, it should be in the courts. We shouldn't do it here where they could have convicted him in the Senate. Um, and we wouldn't be here now because Donald Trump would no longer be eligible to run for president. So you have Mitch McConnell now, which I'm not surprised at the Lincoln Project. We've been saying this. All of these guys would fall in line because of political power and cowardice. And then you have the RNC, which has been pretty much the uh, a, a campaign arm of the Trump campaign for several years. But they've um, their their final step now is that they're going to bring in his daughter-in-law to to be the co-chair. I mean, Michael, you, you know what it's like to run the RNC. Uh, and the, and, and the, these are the people they're putting in charge. It's all a grift. It's because of money. They want to be able to funnel money now to Donald Trump because of his legal, his legal bills. So the idea that the Republican Party is not in the image of, of Trump until now, all of a sudden, this is not a revelation. This has been going on now yeah. for several years, yeah. and every opportunity they've had to offer him from them, they haven't. They put their foot on the gas and embraced him, and it's now become a party that's unrecognizable, a party that is okay with a twice impeached, a criminally indicted, pro-authoritarian, ma malignant narcissist who has no problem wanting to tear up the Constitution on day one and become a dictator. Great so, Republicans. That that's a great brand. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good branding moment for them. I think you know they it'll it'll work out. Sure, I, Doug. I, I think you know uh, to much of what uh, Tara said. Um, you have that po that political uh, storyline un unfolding today, uh, but more importantly, you also have a, a sort of a quasi policy uh, storyline unfolding as NBC News reporting that Biden and Trump are holding competing trips to the U.S.-Mexican border on Thursday uh, to talk border. Oh, my gosh, we're actually going to talk about the border. So on the one hand, um, it's about time. President Biden uh, really kind of put that front and center for himself and, and particularly, I think, take advantage of the opportunity that, on the other hand, Republicans fail to take advantage of uh, by actually uh, supporting a border, legisla border legislation that the Senate and the House uh, presumably tried to pass. What's your take on what we are looking for on Thursday? Well, you know, M Michael, I think so many people are making a lot of the fact that uh, Biden and Trump will be there on the same day. But I think it was really important that the president uh, go to the border before the State of the Union on March the 7th. I think that that's the more important story here, because he has now seen that the, the Congress is not going to do anything. I, there was such high hopes for some border security measures. Uh, for, for what everybody knows is a very serious problem down at the southern border. And there were such high hopes. You had a, a conservative Republican negotiating in good faith with a couple of Democrats, hammering out a very significant bill, one of the toughest in decades. But yet Donald Trump tanked it, just like he tanked one in 2018 when I was there. So the president is having to do this now. You know, look, people have criticized him for not doing more. But his hands are really tied a lot on the border. And the fact is, he is an institutionalist. This mm -hmm. is a legislative session. He's been waiting for that. He had that in his hand. And now he doesn't. And he's got to go to the border. He's got to do some things on his own and hope it will pass legal muster. So I, I think that's going to be the real story. And I think that's an important story to your point. And I think you're right to have the president do this before the State of the Union really kind of sets up narratively the, the storylines that he liked to explore in his speech on, on that uh, evening. But I think there's also another storyline, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, unfolding in Michigan this week with this primary and the fact that you have a, a growing number of disaffected, um, you know, particularly younger voters over the policy such as it is. Um, uh, in the Middle East with respect to Israel and, and Palestine. How do you think that piece fits into this storyline as well for the president? You know, that is a very difficult uh, needle for him to thread right now. 
uh, he has got to support Israel. That is the pro-democracy uh, line that he has had. He has supported Israel for a long time, but he's also been a very strong supporter uh, of a, of a two-party uh, two state. Uh, that is the, a two-state solution. He has been really out there pushing that. And I think what you're seeing, uh, publicly you're seeing a, uh, the, the administration moving more and more to try to figure out how to get a ceasefire, get those hostages home. What we don't see, and, and, I, and I, I hope people recognize this, you're not going to see most of what this administration is doing playing out in the news media or on social media. There is a lot that, that Anthony Blinken and the national security people are doing behind the scenes. And I think they're putting more and more pressure on the Netanyahu government to come to a ceasefire, to do those things necessary, get humanitarian aid. And I, what I'm hoping is that that will happen sooner rather than later. And that as we get closer to the election, folks that are disaffected right now, and I understand that. I mean, I get that. They're right. going to see the difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and they'll come back home. So, so Tara, meanwhile, uh, back in Happy Land, uh, CPAC occurred this past weekend. And as you know, uh, from when we used to go to CPAC, uh, at the end, they'd always do a straw poll. Uh, and, you know, whether it's for the president, well, that's not relevant this time because right. everybody's in the tank for Trump. But they did a vice presidential straw poll. Uh, the CPAC Veep straw poll uh, shows that South, Carol South Dakota uh, Governor Kristi Noem at 15 percent. Vivek Ramaswamy, hmm, how did he get up there? 15 percent. Former Hawaii rep uh, Representative Tulsi Gabbard at nine. Elise Stefanik, whom everyone thinks is kind of like an odds on favorite at eight. Uh, Tim Scott, uh, wow, Tim. Hmm. Eight percent after all of that. Uh, and I think it's important to note that, you know, a lot of folks have been talking up the whole Christy Noem Trump angle. What's your <laughs> take here? How, how do you see these sweepstakes sort of playing out? Well, you and I both know from our years at CPAC <laughs> that the straw poll isn't exactly the most scientific or reliable poll. I mean, Ron Paul used to win that thing all the time. So I'm going to dismiss that as, as anything that's serious. But I can also tell you, those who know, um, Christy Noem will never be vice president. She'll never be a, a pick for Trump because of some of her behavior uh, with other people in the Trump circles. So that will disqualify her off the top. And again, and this is one of those celebrity, um, you know, contests where it's like, oh, who was there? Who was top of mind? And oh, yeah, we like Christy. No, it's not. It, it, it's not happening with her. Um, now, Elise Stefanik, on the other hand, does have a, a greater chance because she has been an absolute sycophant. And she has decided to completely sell her soul to remake herself into a, a Trumplican in ways that are uh, hard to imagine that someone could be such a polar opposite of what they used to be when they first came into Congress. Elise Stefanik is a perfect example of that, of someone who's sold everything out to for political ambition. So to the point where she's defending Donald Trump in his comments calling January 6th uh, defendants and prisoners, political prisoners. I mean, it's really um, pretty obnoxious and outrageous with how low she has gone. Um, but I mean, she's just par, par for the courts. The fact that I, I just have to go back to the Mitch McConnell thing for a second. The fact that Mitch McConnell, seriously, Michael, that Mitch McConnell would even be considering uh, endorsing Donald Trump after everything that Trump has done to him as well. I mean, calling his wife all kinds of ethnic slurs, calling him a piece of crap, according to Maggie Haberman's book, making fun of him and his age, saying all of these disparaging things about him. And, and Mitch McConnell can't stand Donald Trump. He knows that he is someone who isn't a serious yeah. person. But he's willing to do this, which is like if, Trump, if, if McConnell comes out and endorses Trump, what that does is that once again, it opens up the others in the Senate and other donors yeah. to say that Donald Trump is someone we can still support, despite everything he's done. 